forces loyal to Cote d'Ivoire's presidential claimant Alassane Ouattara extend their gains on the ground. But as the incumbent president Laurent Gbagbo clings to power, is the country sliding into civil war? Or would an outside intervention bring the conflict to an end? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the programme. I'm Adrian Finnegan. The battle for control of Côte d'Ivoire appears to be reaching a climax as forces loyal to the internationally recognised president, Alassane Ouattara, attacked the presidential palace in Abidjan to try to unseat the incumbent leader, Laurent Gbagbo. The UN says that both sides should rein in violent attacks as civilians become caught up in the fighting. But as the offensive continues, what lies ahead for Côte d'Ivoire remains uncertain. Caroline Malone reports. Forces of the elected president, Alassane Ouattara, are battling for control of Côte d'Ivoire's largest city. But Lauren Bagbo's troops aren't giving up without a fight. The result, a conflict that's claimed almost 500 lives since November elections, according to the UN. International forces are keeping watch, from all angles, but fear rising civilian casualties. Where suddenly two parties use heavy weaponry in the middle of these densely populated areas. And civilians get caught up in this. They get cut off from supplies, from access to health uh, care. They also get uh, cut off from water supplies and then are exposed to looting and acts of quite uh, significant uh, brutality. The UN Refugee Agency estimates more than a million people have been displaced, fleeing the violence. Watara's troops took the political capital Yamasukro earlier in the week. And in a four-day sweep, they captured several key towns, including the Coco port of San Pedro. Tens of thousands of soldiers, police and other security forces have abandoned Bagbo. And Watara has urged the holdouts to follow their example. À tous ceux qui sont encore to all those who are still hesitating, whether you are generals, officers, superior officers, generals, officers, under officers, officers, rank and file soldiers, I ask you to put yourself officers, at the disposal of your country and return to legality. The rest of the world recognizes Alassane Ouattara as the rightful winner. He took 54% of the vote in elections. But Bagbo has refused to admit defeat. He's been in power since 2000 and has stubbornly ignored calls to step down. Watara's fighters are now in control of about 80% of the country, acting after a four-month standoff. They say the end of Bagbo's rule is a matter of hours away. Caroline Malone, Al Jazeera. Well, to discuss the ongoing conflict in Côte d'Ivoire, we're joined by our guests today from London, Michael Amoa, political analyst specialising in African affairs and author of Reconstructing the Nation in Africa. From Paris, Francois Ndengue, founder of the African Advisory Board, a consultancy on economic development in Africa. And here in Doha, Sylvain Tuati, uh, an associate fellow at the French Institute for International Relations. Gentlemen, welcome to Inside Story. Michael, allow us to tap into your expertise first, if you would. For the benefit of anyone unfamiliar uh, with the intricacies of Ivorian politics, why has Laurent Gbagbo so steadfastly refused to step down in, in spite of the, the, the weight of international opinion, opinion that says that he's lost his mandate? Well, as is obvious, Gbagbo he always wants to be in power. Um, from 2004, he has postponed six elections because the situation didn't quite suit him. And in the course of that tenure, he's also um, fired one prime minister and undermined another prime minister. Um, and what seems to have happened is that at the first election, well, finally, when the election took place in October 2010, the first round, um, he, 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 went, he went ahead. And at the second round, um, that was very close. The UN Operation Côte d'Ivoire, that's the UNOCI, um, and the Electoral Commission judged that Watara won 54.1% and Gbagbo won 45.9%. And it turns out also that the Constitutional Court said that instead Gbagbo won by 51%, 51.9%, and Watara lost by 48.1%. Um, the UNOCI and the rest of the international community have judged that Watara won the election. 
and Gbagbo decided that he has rather won. So he decided that he was not going to hand over power. So that's the scenario which has been building um, up to date. And all parties have, have sort of said to Gbagbo that he needs to hand over power peacefully, but he also does not intend to do that. So here we are as we speak, what's happening at the moment. All right, Francois, will a Cote d'Ivoire without Laurent Gbagbo be peaceful? Do the country's troubles end with his departure? Yes, this is something quite possible. But one very important thing here that we must stress is that starting from yesterday, we're getting into a new logic. It's a logic of force. It's logic of using uh, military force to get to power. Before that, we had the, the logic of elections. And we, you had the, we had numerous missions from ECOWAX, from the African Union, numerous head of states, numerous uh, meetings, numerous uh, mediations. Though these all failed. So I think that started from yesterday, we're getting into a new logic. And coming back to your question, I think that uh, it will be up to the, the new president if this thing ended with President Ouattara becoming effectively in power, it will be up to him to work so that the country become peaceful. And this is something that I think is possible. Sylvain Francois says that uh, Cote d'Ivoire without Laurent Bagbo uh, would be peaceful and that the country's problems would end if he goes. Do you, do you agree with that or uh, do you fear, as so many do at the moment, that we could be seeing uh, the beginning of, of a new civil war? No, I don't think so, because uh, the situation has changed in one week. Uh, the four days of offensive of what, our f of what our forces have been very successful and even uh, impressed most of the observators. In four days, he took control of most of the country, and uh, now Gbagbo is uh, he's only surrounded by these hardliners. At the last place, he's only controlling at the last, uh, from the last news only one or two districts in uh, Abidjan. And, uh, is, uh, is around the presidential palace. So right now we're seeing probably uh, the last uh, round uh, of the, the, the fighting. So the civil war only, at the moment, only lasted a week. Um, from that, uh, even if Ouattara took power, size power uh, uh, by, by next week or in the coming days, um, there will be a lot of things to do for him. First, he will need to uh, assure his power because at the moment his, um, his, uh, his supporters are an alliance from different sides. You have to remember that between the two rounds of the presidential election, former President Beji supported Ouattara. And uh, so he, they will need to find uh, a government together. They already nominated uh, one, but they will probably uh, change it uh, if he cites power in Abidjan. And also he will have to um, imp impose his, po his power and uh, his, his, uh, his rule towards all the, the, the rebellion in the Force Nouvelle, because at the moment it's a, it's a large alliance from militia, from former rebels, and some people who are backing Ouattara. And uh, in the coming days, in the coming weeks, that will be uh, one of the main challenges of Ouattara, is to impose his authority over all the people who are uh, speaking on his name. Michael Amoa, you outlined for us a, f a few moments ago uh, the closeness uh, of the, the presidential vote uh, and the fact that uh, Alassane Ouattara is the internationally recognized winner of that vote. Uh, Laurent Bagbo refuses to accept that, uh, that he didn't win. Why has this situation been allowed to drag on as long as it has? Why has not Alassane Ouattara uh, taken the initiative uh, and entered into dialogue with Bagbo? Well, the reason Ouattara does not want to enter into dialogue with Gbagbo and has not is because he knows that Gbagbo would want to offer a political settlement, um, which either power sharing or some form of arrangement whereby one of them is prime minister and the other is president. And Ouattara obviously does not want any of that, so he basically refused to talk. And that's why we've come to this situation. Um, Bagbo also calculated that as long as he's got Ouattara holed up in the Gulf Hotel, then at least he's got him um, sidelined somehow. But it happens also that the forces Nouvelle have actually broken the floodgates of the zone of confidence that divided the geographical north and the geographical south. So it turns out that the forces Nouvelle have invaded the southern territory um, and, and so, so there's been a bit of miscalculation there. But essentially, Watara 
did not want to speak with Gbagbo because he did not want any political settlement other than he being the president. But excuse excuse Francois, me, I have to intervene uh, on I that, sorry, uh, yes. because uh, that's so uh, maybe not really yes, uh, what happened. Because we have negotiation going on for more than four months now. Everyone, the uh, African Union, the international community, the UN, everyone tried to settle a discussion between the two. Uh, honestly, at the moment, we can say, and we've seen that at, in Addis Abeba at the beginning of the month, um, it's the fact that Laurent Gbagbo didn't come, didn't show off. He was not willing to discuss. I don't think Ouattara refused to discuss with Laurent Gbagbo. Even Alassane Ouattara proposed to organize a union government. He proposed um, to Gbagbo's uh, supporters to join him in the new government. And his proposal have never been answered by Gbagbo's side. I think we need to make it clear right now. Francois, by refusing to talk to Bagbo to negotiate a, a, an end to this crisis, uh, do you think that he'll be left with blood on his hands? Will ordinary Ivorians caught up in the violence that we're currently seeing in Abidjan and elsewhere uh, in the country come to see Ouattara in the same light as they see Bagbo? Yeah, uh, I, th yes, yeah, this is a very good, important question. That's why I said at the beginning that we're entering a new logic. Before that, we had the logic of elections. We have a logic of the votes of the voice of the people of uh, Côte d'Ivoire. Now it's a logic of war on weapons. And there is, there is a chance that uh, Ouattara could be seen at coming to power under a bloodshed. But I think that up to now, uh, the Republican forces of Côte d'Ivoire, this is the new name of the army under Ouattara, has shown, in my view, a superior tactic skills regarding if you compare it with what uh, the uh, Laurent Gbagbo force did. You know that due from the last three uh, months, they have been uh, infiltrating Abidjan already. And if you see that in just four days, they came down south along three lines and they blocked the, f the, the, the boundary, the frontier with Liberia. So that in very, they, they, they got into uh, Abidjan very easily. And this is something that was quite surprised to, to most of the people. So they have shown a superior tactic uh, uh, skills in the military tactics. So I think even if there are some bloodshed, it will be limited. But again, it is up to the new president to show, to bring trust to the, pe to the whole people of Côte d'Ivoire. And I think Sylvain were very, were very, um, was very right when he was saying that he probably will have a new government and this government will be a government that will try to, be, to build peace in Côte d'Ivoire because this is what the people of Côte d'Ivoire need. Francois, as, as Michael was outlining for us a few moments ago, that election, the presidential election, that was remarkably close. Uh, outline for us, uh, if you wouldn't mind, uh, where Laurent Bagbo's support base is in, in Côte d'Ivoire. Who are his supporters and why uh, do they remain so loyal to him? Uh, you know that uh, Laurent Bagbo, his, his political party, uh, called FBI. It was a very important party. And Lorak Babo had a background as a fighter for democracy. His role in bringing back democracy in Côte d'Ivoire is something that we could applaud. He's, during the opposition under the former president, uh, Oufouet Boigny, he stood up for democracy in Côte d'Ivoire. And this is something that we could put to his credit. And uh, many young people in Côte d'Ivoire was behind him. So he has a very large base, a youth base, and uh, the problem is that um, after the after the the the, uh, the first the, the civil war, you know that his government in 2002 they have this it was attacked, so the base become, uh, began to, to shrink. But starting, he has a very good credentials as a fighter for for freedom in Cote d'Ivoire. I think this is something to put on his credit that could explain why people remain loyal to him. Sylvain, um, to what extent have the African Union and perhaps even the United Nations uh, exacerbated, prolonged this, this impasse in, in Côte d'Ivoire? I don't think they have really uh, prolonged it in the sense that uh, they were there to protect civilians. That's why you have the ONU see on the field, is to protect civilians. And I think for the last eight years, they have done a great job for, for this aspect. Of course, um, put peacekeepers on the field doesn't resolve the political stalemate, and you need to have a political decision at the end. And the international community can take the decision for the Ivorian. They are, the Ivorians need to, to take a decision. And um, I think with the radicalization of the both sides, uh, maybe this fighting was uh, ineluctable and um, 
but at the same time, I see that maybe sizing the power by force uh, for Alassane Watawa is could be um, a finish in a bloodshed, and that I hope is not going to happen. But also could be a really a strong support for him because now Laurent Gbagbo's as liners and uh, the people he, 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 he used propaganda on and that were really motivated. If they defeated now, I think there will be a large space for Alassane Ouattara to talk to most of the, for to talk to the moderate uh, Gbagbo uh, support and maybe to, to, to bring more more unity in the coming in the coming weeks. That's what we can hope for for Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, yeah, you talk about uh, uh, that un unity. How realistic I I is it? You know, is that hope uh, uh, for, for unity? Will will the country return to calm once uh, Bagbo has has gone? It will be difficult. Uh, don't, don't don't get me wrong. It, yeah. it will be a very uh, difficult political uh, uh, challenge for for Watara and his supporters. But first, you have to remember that uh, at the beginning of this crisis, you have three different political forces. Uh, Watara supporters, you have also former president party, and you have Laurent Gbagbo. Uh, right now, Watara got the support from President Beji, and if he finds some uh, agreement with the moderate um, people from Laurent Gbagbo, he could have a really light unity government, even after, after, after the, the fighting. Uh, and also, what is really important for us, uh, and what we've seen in the last two days is the fact that um, the moderate uh, supporter for Laurent Gbagbo have been abandoning the camp. Uh, we've seen that uh, the, former, the head of, of the army have, uh, have uh, seek ad asylum to the South African embassy. Uh, we've seen the many um, Laurent Gbagbo uh, key political figures abandoning him or going into exile. So in fact, Laurent Gbagbo and, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is only surrounded now by hardliners. And if they beaten by force, it will open a new era for um, Côte d'Ivoire political uh, situation. Michael, will, will a, a unity government work in Côte d'Ivoire? It's going to be quite tricky. Well, first of all, Ouattara has already made it clear that he is not very much interested in, in a unity government, which is why he did not uh, want to go along with the final mediation efforts from the African Union. Um, however, if the country has to unite, Ouattara has to find a way of forming a unity government in, in practical terms because you have to remember that half of the country is just half of the country that voted for him. Besides that, uh, the forces Nouvelle are more or less an irregular army and you've got a sitting army already there. So you have to find a way of actually having a national army that will be inclusive, that could also be regularized and be accepted by the country. Um, quite apart from that, we know there is a backlog of um, ethnic discrimination against people in the north, the so-called Ivoirite concept. And it's quite important that whoever the president will be will ensure that Ivoirite does not occur at the same time is not using it as an opportunity for a payback time whereby, you know, uh, you have to settle scores. This, is, this will be a time for actually reconstructing the nation as it were. And a unity government is, is actually what you need to go for. What about the division of the country? It's one man ruling the north, one man ruling the south. Would that have worked as a, as a political solution in uh, in That Cote would have worked, let's say, four weeks ago if, if Ouattara was prepared to go for that political settlement. Um, I ask at the moment that Ouattara is not prepared for that and his forces have managed to get to Abidjan. There is no way he will even want to think about that any longer. I think for now he's probably just thinking about when will I become de facto president announcing from the national broadcasting station. Um, so We'll just have to wait and see what pans out um, in, in, in the next few days and weeks ahead. But whatever the case may be, it is essential that Ouattara forms a unity government, which is not just politically overviewed, but actually to, inv to, 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 inv to involve all the institutions of the country, ethnically, militarily, um, state-wise, you know, the legal, political system. The whole system has to be revamped and work towards reconstructing um, a new nation or, or a government of national unity. We also have to know that 
his Watara's own Prime Minister Guillaume Soro was part of a unity government with Gbagbo. So at least he will know how to go about things. And he will bear in mind um, that, that that will be a good example for the future because should Watara become president in the next few days or so, Watara doesn't look like someone who would want to go away after the first term. And Guillaume Soro does not look like someone who can sit down for another eight, ten years before he becomes president. So we've got some few interesting years ahead of Cote d'Ivoire, even within Ouattara's own camp, and that's going to look very interesting. So it would be better for him if he actually tried to unite the country than divide it. Francois, do you agree? And where do you stand on this issue of the, the AU and whether it's helped or hindered in Cote d'Ivoire? Uh, <clears throat> AU has played a mixed role, uh, a, a mixed role here. And it was not easy. It was the first time. And I think that uh, from now we should look on the f to the future. Everything, look at the mistakes all of the parties have made, the AU, the UN, and even the, the Wataras and the, um, the Constitutional Courts, et cetera, et cetera. But I think the biggest mistake was the decision of the Constitutional Court. But this is the past. We have to look at the future. Uh, you were asking about the issue of the government of national unity, or you call it a sharing power and this and so forth and so on. I think this, uh, this is up to, the, up to the Ivorians, but I think this is not a formula for success. Even before, the, the government that organized the elections were already a government of national unity. So a government of national unity will only create confusion. Government of national unity, is big, the name unity sounds good, but it will create irresponsibility too, because people have voted, people cast their vote for a program, and there is a, a winner. If there is a winner, the winner should take charge of, of the, the executive, and then you have the opposition. But the issue here is that it's not only the executive. You have the National Assembly too. You have this, you have to have the functioning uh, state. You have the, the executive, you have the legislative, and you have the judiciary. You have to have the election to elect the, 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 the member of the parliament. And th the one thing very interesting here is that uh, yeah. Professor Mamadou Koulibaly, who is the the chairman of the, uh, the National Assembly of Côte d'Ivoire, who is also a member of the, the party, of uh, Bagdos party, yeah. is a very competent person, so that even you should not have a government of national unity. Let the one who won be the president, okay. and let the states and all okay. the, the branches of government functions correctly. Right. Francois, we're, we're, we're almost out of time. I, we've got about a minute and a half left here. I, I just want to get your thoughts, final thoughts, uh, please, on what the situation in Côte d'Ivoire uh, teaches us about the prospects for democracy elsewhere in Africa. I think that if, if we look at democracy, uh, it, normally there are two things. I think first, the process of choosing a ruler, and then the way the power is exercised. We have to work very seriously in Africa because we're having the problems of post-electoral disputes every time, meaning that even the process of choosing the first step of what is called democracy or the process of choosing the leaders is not already all right. And then you have the, the, how pro, uh, uh, the power is exercised. So I think we have the, the very important thing regarding African societies is that we have societies that are the most uh, ethnically uh, heterogeneous societies. If, are we sure that the concept of democracy as it is used in the West, where most countries are almost homogeneous, so are we sure that this concept could work in Africa? Because if you look what is happening, yeah. we see what happened in Kenya, we see the problem we had in Zimbabwe, we're having in Zimbabwe, you see what we have in, in Benin. And besides that, Africa is facing very great challenges, economic yeah. and political challenges. Look what is happening in Libya. So we have to th think, African thinkers. Uh, we're going to have to end our discussion. Many thanks indeed. Michael Amoa uh, in London, Francois Ndengue in Paris, and Sylvain Tuati, who is uh, here in Doha. Uh, and thank you for being with us uh, for this edition of Inside Story. As always, we welcome uh, your suggestions, your comments. You can email us at uh, InsideStory at AlJazeera.net. From all of us on the program, bye for now.